trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Are bestsellers all they're hyped up to be? The Terrible Book Club explores whether or not you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. If you've ever seen a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. I'm Friss, and this is Paris. <laughs> Hello, Friss. How you doing today? Um, this time around. Wait, we... does that does that make me Pobby? Am I Pobby uh, now? <laughs> no, it doesn't fit. It doesn't. You know. God damn the it. The joke I made. It doesn't. It, it's only for me. I'm sorry, Paris. Yeah, yeah, that was it. only for you. <laughs> okay, we'll get to why that was funny in a second. But uh, first, we need to say what we even read this time. And we return to an old friend, Paris. A dear, <laughs> yeah. dear friend. Yeah, we return to an old friend. Um, his name is Rich Shapiro. And he wrote and... Too Far. Mm -hmm. he, he also wrote Wild Animus, an episode that was kind of in the Lost episode uh, collection that we keep referencing as one of the worst book that we've read by a wide margin. So yeah. when we came back to Rich here... Um, we were expecting some more of that kind of thing. And we did kind of get more of the same in some ways and in other ways we didn't. Yeah. So, um, I guess we could just quickly recap, uh, Wild Animus, uh, what it was about and why it was so bad since that episode has been lost to the, the sands of Chris's delete button on his computer. Um, yep. so Wild Animus. It's a very sandy keyboard. Uh, yeah. I like yeah. It. It's just covered I, in I sand. do all my editing at the beach turns <laughs> In the desert, uh, which it, it still feels like the desert uh, here at Terra Book Club headquarters, FYI. It's still like 95 degrees and we're dying. We're dying for your amusement. Um, anyway. I'm under the thumb of my vicious audio tyranny where I will not have any fan noise on my audio tracks. <laughs> no, no, I'm with you there. Uh, but Wild Animus was about a guy and his girlfriend... And his ram fetish. And his um, obsession with... <coughs> excuse me. His obsession with becoming a ram. That's right. Becoming a ram. So he uh, takes a bunch of hallucinogenic drugs, goes to crazy lengths, such as like moving him and his girlfriend closer to a mountain where these rams live, making a ram suit, and then plunging his girlfriend into a very deadly situation on the mountain in an effort uh, to become a ram. He thinks there's a ram god. Uh, he also treats his girlfriend like total garbage throughout the entire book. Uh, and I'm, I'm struggling to remember if there was anything else, but um, it was... I think the key point to, to bring back up here is that there was some kind of god that the main character felt affiliated with that was of nature or come from nature or resided in nature that the main character wanted to have deeper c contact with or connection with, which turns out might be a bit of a Rich Shapiro trope. Uh, yeah, Rich Shapiro really has this... Uh... He has this romanticized uh, concept of the non-human environment. Um, I, I don't like to call it nature because I, humans are fucking animals and we exist in the world. Uh, we so, are fucking animals. We fucking yeah, animals. That yeah. fuck. um, and so... <laughs> of, of the genus fucking animal, of the animals that fuck. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and Rich seems to have this this really like romanticized version of nature and he kind of has this... Uh, um, what is that concept called? Uh, Hydrith or Hiraith or whatever. The, the the concept of like this this yearning for a past that uh, is no longer no longer there. Um, he also likes to put gods in inanimate objects like rocks and trees and meadows. Yeah, there's a lot of animism. Wind. There's a lot of animism um, in all of his work. And and like I don't necessarily. Well, have we can't any... say all of it. We've only read half of so half of his work because he has four books and now we've read two. 
Okay. So well, I read the we synopsis. Know the other two, yes. I read the synopsis for the other two, and it it sounds like it's just more of the same. Right, uh, well. I, maybe someday we'll find out for sure. Ugh. Um. Trying so, to give due credit here, you know. Well, yeah, and so I don't really, you know, I don't have an issue with that concept. In fact, I myself am, uh, you know, often drawn to things that are like, hey, let's look at the non-human environment and actually care about it and give a shit and, like, not throw straws at it or, you know, like, <laughs> is that whatever. What is, that the t- uh, is that really, like, the height of the bad things that we're doing? Uh, no, straws, just straws are just on my mind straws. because it's a big... Well, it, it is literally a huge problem, um, and there's this... All of a sudden, people give a shit that uh, sea animals are dying due to plastic pollution. I, I don't know. I don't know. I guess it's just been floating sure under people's straws, radar. Straws. I mean, not to denigrate uh, the whole straw thing. Sure, stop using as many as you can. But I'm pretty sure there's uh, worse culprits <laughs> than our straw use. Uh, I don't know. It's pretty bad. I mean, obviously, on an individual I think massive level, massive agriculture based corporations might have a little yes, bit more yes yes okay. Cor- i was just gonna say on an individual level single-use plastics are a huge problem but like corporations are the ones that contribute to oh god it's like 90 something percent of all pollution so there's that anyway this isn't supposed to be yeah, about that, yeah sorry right. sorry that, for that yeah. digression everyone but um i don't know look look some shit up um <laughs> but <laughs> you know and and i appreciate that about his work um however i remember it being a struggle to read Wild Animus. I remember oh, yeah. we, were, we were both so mad the whole time because all of the prose was just so... Oh, it was just so, like, inflated and... Um, Purple I don't, he was just and trying... overwrought. Every yeah. other sentence is something deep and meaningful to say. Yeah, he was and... just trying really hard to sound as, like, as deep as Deepak Chopra, like, as, you know, he's trying to, like, go full spiritual healer on you kind of throughout the whole book. And then it's also, you know, juxtaposed with this, the guy, the main character trying to be, a, trying to actually become a fucking ram and, like, putting on a ram suit. And it's, it's just, it was just too, it was, like, a, it was, like, too much absurdity uh, on both, like, a physical and spiritual level, I guess. Um, yeah. There's... Still some of that here. People still talk like space aliens for the most part. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have to say. Well, well, here's the difference, though. The adults in this, in Too Far, um, I feel like the adult dialogue is mostly fine, except for the uh, crazy mom. We should probably tell everyone what this book is about now that we're done talking about wild animus. <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. So, uh, Too Far uh, is about... The relationship between two six-year-olds named Robbie and Fristine. So Fristine, this you know, is, a, a yeah. normal person name. That yeah. is what people this call. Is, this is like, like, who is named Fristine? Uh, who, how Why did he come up that with that name? name? Uh, how so, did he come up with that so name? So I think I found a little. I think I may have found the reason for the name uh, on his website. He has an interview. He has an interview with himself on his website. Uh, somebody oh. else did the interview. <laughs> Hi, I Rich. Hope. How are you doing? I'm Rich. Nice to meet yeah, you. Yeah, no, well, I, <laughs> no, I think someone else interviewed him, but nonetheless, the interview in full is posted on his website um, about the writing of this book and the process. And uh, it seems like he consulted his then six-year-old daughter. So he wrote the first drafts like a long time ago in like the late eighties. And then he decided to finish it. I think when his daughter was about six. And so he kind of like took his daughter's advice. So my guess is maybe, maybe she was like, don't make it Christine. It's Fristine. You know, and he was like, Oh, that's dumb and childish. I don't know. That's just my guess. Um, Cause he said that what is she... it with some authors and like asking their kids for ideas on writing. I've noticed this, it, like there's some <laughs> yeah, other terrible books that we've kind of we... looked over. <laughs> we got to tell everyone like... about that one. <laughs> There was there was some sci-fi book that someone posted on our Instagram, like a link to it because they think we're a, a, a regular book reading club. Dude, and this happens all the every... time. Yeah. Anyway, you look in the synopsis of the, this person's uh, work, and they said that they consulted their children for story ideas, and I'm like, well, that's probably not a great source for stories that make sense or names that make sense in this uh, case. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think it's um. I think it's a good exercise to do with your children, but should it be published? Probably fucking not. Um, (laughs) But, uh, you know, back to too far. So Robbie and Christine are six years old and they meet one day uh, just kind of by chance. So Robbie and his family have just moved to Fairbanks, Alaska, because his father is a graduate or doctoral student at the university in Fairbanks. 
uh, which is a thing that exists. Um, and his mom, it seems like his mom didn't really want to move them there. It's like, you know, Fairbanks is pretty remote. I mean, they've got a university, an airport, an army base, and I think some ski resorts. That's like it over there. Um, so it's not it's not heavily they have populated. People with weird names over there. <laughs> yeah, they out. have a lot of fristines. Uh, <laughs> so the kids just kind of meet because you know when you're a little kid and it's it's summertime. The book is largely set in the summer. Uh, you know, you just go play outside or whatever. Um, Robbie constantly breaks his parents' rules and goes, you know, quote, too far. He goes uh, beyond the points at which they've determined is appropriate for him to travel at six years old by himself in the woods of Alaska. Parents get mad about it. You know, he meets Fristine. Uh, his mom doesn't want him to hang out with Fristine because Fristine's mom is presumably a junkie. Uh, she just has some alcohol and pill problems and a lot of smokes substance. a lot of it, weed. It, and, it seems yeah. like she just takes a whole lot of different things. Yeah, it, yeah. At least it's implied that she does. Yeah, and then she has this, like, violent, angry boyfriend who's around sometimes. She doesn't really take good care of Fristine. You know, the house is in disarray. Sometimes there's no food in the house. And so Robbie... And, and Robbie doesn't like that his mom tries to, like, you know... I don't know, Krampus style or whatever. Kramp, Krampus style? I don't, I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't like that his mom uh, puts these boundaries on him. Uh, and so he and Fristine have this friendship and they, they try to keep it secret, uh, from their parents. Robbie eventually meets, uh, Gray, is it Gracie or Grace? Grace. It's Grace. Uh, it's Christine's Grace. mom, Grace. Uh, that whole, sh that's all weird. And the kids, yeah, they have this, this friendship relationship. Uh, things take a real yeah, weird Rich Shapiro yeah. turn. Uh, and the kids have a really creepy relationship that made me uncomfortable. How about you, Chris? Yeah, uh, yeah Rich really, like, hey, Paris, have you ever wanted to read a romance novel starring two six-year-olds? Because that's <laughs> no. what this felt like. Yeah, and, and that it made me a little because, like, they have like these convers like they go out into nature all the time, and they they find like they find like their little areas that they give cutesy kid names to, and uh, they like end up sort of like cuddling a whole lot, I guess. And the way that Robbie is written as like interpreting these things is very it's like he very concerned with the softness and closeness of Fristine to him and whispering into his ear and her smell and her prettiness so it made me really uncomfortable that a yeah. six-year-old i don't think a six-year-old boy would interact with a six-year-old girl like that no no and that thing yeah and i and i had the same problem where i i thought back and i was like okay when i was six I definitely wasn't thinking uh, this romantically about anyone. You know, you have when you're a little kid, you know, you might have a crush on someone and you say he's my husband or she's my wife or whatever. But like you're not you're not having these deep ruminations about it and thinking of a future together. It's and, more you're and, mimicking adults around you who say right. stuff about that. Yeah, and I don't, you know, I think that children can have friends and I sure, certainly think they can have crushes, you know, at six, but it's uh, yeah, my my issue is that the the child dialogue in this book is is where the book fails because the adult dialogue I think is mostly fine except for Grace. Like I said, I think her dialogue is way off the mark. Um, but also because it's creepy and bizarre. Um, and uh, the actual descriptive writing, dare I say it, is kind of good. Like I I hate to say it's it, and bad. I think I think I think Chris might disagree with me a little bit, but. Um, he does. No, a, I just said it's not bad. So he does a really good job uh, d describing uh, their environments. He clearly is really obsessed with like Alaskan botany or something. I don't know. There's like so many <laughs> names of plants and flowers in here that I had to keep looking it up, which was sort of annoying. But hey, I learned something. Whatever. Um, but it, yeah, he just does a really good job with uh, his descriptions, and I, I felt like the writing was fine. Like I was reading this, and I was going. Is this fucking Rich Shapiro? Like, what am what am I reading? Because I don't. I, Wild Animus was, oh, it was it was, well, it was wildly different in a very negative way. Um, well, but, this one, like Wild Animus, was his first one. This one, his latest one. There was two books in between, so maybe there's some improvement in exactly how deep he has to get all the time. But let me. We were talking about how like weird the child the child dialogue is, and I'm gonna read a little passage here. Oh from the boy, book. It's, okay. It's like literally the fourth page in the book when Robbie and Fristine are first meeting, and I'm kind of like starting in the middle of it on the weirdest line possible. But you know, you don't need that much context on what's happening. They just met and they're in, literally interacting for the first time. 
I'm entering the special place, she said. Robbie heard an invitation. Are you? Sure, he answered, shutting his eyes. The wind sings my songs, the girl said. So do the leaves. I show them how. Robbie tried to imagine how you could do that. Your turn, she said. Okay. Robbie tried to think. I could write my name backwards. He frowned. What's so special about that? He cracked his lids. She was still immersed. When I smile, the whole world feels warm, she said. That's something, Robbie thought, closing his eyes again. I fly in my dreams. I can be as invisible as air, the girl said, in real life. When my friends are in danger, I rescue them. She giggled. No one remembers what I remember. I go anywhere in the forest, Robbie said, and I never get lost. That's not how six-year-olds talk! Yeah, I don't think six-year-olds <laughs> talk sorry. like that. Um, there's a, yeah, there's a bunch of... And that that's kind of the thing. I'm I'm I want to see if I can find everyone's um, so deep and spit like oh I'm 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 a, a a flower in the sky, Paris, and the clouds <laughs> yep. carry my dreams <laughs> into my brain. I can talk <sighs> to the air and oh, yeah. dance with the 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 bunnies. And also, um, uh, the other. <laughs> The the other uh, uncharacteristic six year old thing about this book is that Robbie is really into neurology and uh, brain chemistry, and he has posters in his room about brains and nerves. And his dad reads him stories every night about those topics. Seems a little much for a six year old. I've never met a six year old who was like, "I want to be a neurologist." You know, like it doesn't it doesn't make any sense. Maybe more around like eight or nine. And like there's a there's, so there's a lot of stuff in this book that could work better if the main characters were of a different age i feel like if they were 12 to 13 or maybe even 11 a lot more of this stuff would make more sense and we're not even talking about like the fucking lsd trip part of this book which we'll get to in a minute right um yeah the dialogue is just really awkward um so the heavy um, side. <laughs> yeah because you just i realized uh, something yeah because i realized, just realized I was, where you were and what you were doing and no, how you're because, spending your time <laughs> because i realized i was going to read one of the creepy passages from grace so grace is christine's mom and in this passage uh she's talking to robbie i think it's the first time they meet yeah it's the first time they meet not so fast <laughs> ramen i can't read that <laughs> You're okay. right. I I can't read that. Oh, Romeo, Jesus Christ! <laughs> Not so fast, Robin. Did you forget how to read? Sorry, his terrible book club had such an effect on you that you can no longer even read no. Paris. No, it's just that my eyesight is bad. The text is small, and it's far away from my face. So, welcome I should... to my entire life. Oh, hey, Paris. you know what? My glasses would be good to have on. I usually don't wear them with uh, screens because it's bad for me, but I need it right now. Nope, that still looks like Ramen even with my glasses. <laughs> On. Okay, this font. Not, not so for me. fast, Ramen. <laughs> I'm gonna have to eat you instead. Uh, not so fast, Romeo. Grace laughed. I've heard about you. Robbie laughed back. Grace reached for something on the mattress. It was like a tiny box of Kleenex. She pulled some tissues out and stuck them together. Then she opened the baggie and put some of the dried plants inside. She folded it and it turned into a cigarette. She lit it and took a deep breath, peering through the smoke at him. I'm mystified, she exhaled, exhaled in his direction. <laughs> Christine says. Robbie sniffed at the sweet vapor. You're very close. Robbie nodded. I'm going to marry her. Grace eyed him with amazement. In one day? Yep. It's so different, she turned aside. When you're older, when you sleep with the one you love. I'd like to do that. Grace burst out laughing. I'm sorry. She gave him a kindly look. I'm sure it will be wonderful when you do. There's a whole lot of that kind of creepiness in the... Because they do get married later, turns out. Yeah. And how, you know how you get married, Paris? Here's yeah. how you get married, Yeah, right? all right, step one. Okay, so you go into the woods with step your two. girlfriend. Step two, right? Yep. Now, you're going to want to lay down, and she's going to hug you while also laying down. Now, you're going to want to be next to a hill, because then you roll down the hill, yep. and then you're married. At least that's according to the forest gods Yeah, that you just watched have sex in front of you. (laughs) Yeah, that happens. Uh, Yeah, there's just a (laughs) lot of sex and drugs in this book. I mean, obviously, this even though this book stars to six-year-olds, it's not meant for children. Thankfully, Shapiro even says that explicitly. Uh, So thank God for that, I guess. Um, I don't think, I mean, a child would pick this up and not know what the fuck they were reading anyway. Uh, But yeah, I mean, it's just weird having a... 
uh, like this and also the, the like drugged out mom who's smoking pot is like <laughs> yeah you're gonna marry my daughter well i hope it's nice when you fuck her like jesus Christ, why would anyone say that to a six-year-old i mean i know it wasn't quite I that explicit but more just like okay i think you're being a little too going too far <laughs> there uh, 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 in, in that uh, you know a parent Listening to a kid say that they're just going to take it as not serious. They don't know what they're talking about. Just laugh at them about it. Well, no, but the and problem she- is in two pages. This scene happens. I'm going to kiss you again. She raised herself, shook the leaves from her hair, and was halfway to his cheek when his expression stopped her. Christine. She waited for him to speak. Let's sleep together, Robbie said. Here? He nodded. She thought for a moment. Okay. A, ma- a coarse rasp sounded above them. The squirrel was hunched in the willow lattice, watching, and as they spotted him, he launched through the branches, chattering for all he was worth. He'll tell everyone, Fristine warned. Then she curled next to Robbie with her cheek on his shoulder. That's nice. Strands of her hair webbed his face. He could feel her breath. Did you ever have a girl for a friend? She asked. No, he said. Did you? She put her hand on his chest. You're the first. Robbie could feel her warmth all down his side, and then her lips pressed against his cheek. His hands were trembling. He had a presentiment, a feeling of anticipation unlike anything he'd experienced. Something really important was happening, but he wasn't sure what. When you love someone and you're sleeping with them, he could barely speak. You put your arms around them. You do other things, too. Yep, Robbie took a breath. You kiss their lips. They're here, Christine said. Who? Listen, Christine whispered. And then, I don't know, then they just talk about squirrels, but, uh... Yeah, I mean that that whole scene now is just we're really on a creepy. List, by the way, this podcast is officially on just, some kind of list somewhere of I mean, and, places where creepy things about six year olds have been read out. Well, loud. I mean, I guess, I guess the, the, the point I'm trying to make is like it's close, it's close, but not quite. Like you know, little kids have those moments, but just the way that it's described is just so creepy, and the dialogue is so weird. Yeah, uh, once yeah. again, that the, the the back and forth. If you read those lines, like just read those lines of dialogue without the description part between them, and see if it sounds like a human conversation. To <laughs> yeah. You. Oh, and then there's another. There's like other weird little spurts of sexual content. Again, a couple pages later. There's um, the uh, I'll show you mine if you show me yours scene, which oh, was yeah. deeply uncomfortable for uh, me to read. Yeah, me too. I mean, and and like I said, I know kids do that stuff. But the problem in this book is that the kids were very conscious of what they were doing while they were yep. while they were doing that at six years old. So at six years old, they're showing each other their genitals in a very conscious way. Like, oh, man, we just, you know, we just did it, even though obviously they didn't. But like, it, yeah, it, it's uh, it's just so once again, up. if they were maybe more like 12, 13, it would make a lot more sense. Yeah, I mean, I still wouldn't and- feel great reading it, but I would be like, OK, that's. You know, that's a reasonable thing. It would feel thing. more appropriate. For, and like, you know, 12 or 13 year olds could go out and adventure in the woods and have rules from their parents on how far they could go and yeah. might just be blossoming into feeling different emotional feelings, especially towards whatever sex they're attracted to. Yeah, I mean, and I, I feel the same way. Like, um, I, I just think these these kids should have been like, yeah, like 14 to 16 and, and a little older than what Chris was recommending because um, they kind of passively do drugs and i also think that this whole book sounds like an lsd trip because that's just what rich shapiro does is he writes books that sound like you're doing crazy hallucinogens um yeah chris why don't you tell us about the drugs these children passively do at one point fristine brings some brownies with her from her house into one of their like nature walks out into the areas that they go you can see where this is going Uh, and, and, and she described when they bite into them, they're described as having seeds in them and having kind of maybe other plant material in them. So it's I guess they're supposed to be weed brownies, but I don't rich. That's not how you make weed brownies. I don't know if you know that you sound like a guy that would have smoked some weed and had an edible in his time. So I don't understand why you don't know how a weed brownie is made, but it's definitely not by putting the seeds and plant matter into just brownie batter because then it would just burn up and you'd just have ash in there you need to make can of butter to to put into the brownie mix can you, can you, you explain just get... can you explain what can of butter is for those of oh us who... it, 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 you basically you, you melt some fat butter usually works best and you heat it up you put the wheat in there and you heat it up just enough so that it's activating sort of the the cannabis uh cannabinoids on the the plants to transfer into the fat but not so hot that you actually 
burn it. And oh, so you s- make so you make like fat tea. Yeah, essentially, okay. yeah. But okay, you can't, fat weed you, tea. You, you, yeah, you can't burn it, or else it won't work. You just have burnt plant matter in butter, and then anything you can put butter into, you can infuse with weed, and you can make a thing that gets you high. So if you can think of a thing that you put butter in, you can make it make you get high that way. How it's not they... just by smashing weed material into the thing and cooking it. How do they make gummies then? Because that doesn't have butter in it. I, I don't know. I'm just asking out of my own curiosity. THC is fat soluble, so any kind of like fat content that you can get oh, into gummies okay. or whatever. <clears throat> Yeah, so that was weird. Um, luckily, it's just a short passage. But honestly, like this book would make so much more sense if these characters were sixteen and dropping acid. Like the like, it just would make so much more sense because the whole book is built upon these two children having this relationship and creating this fantasy world within the forest. And the fantasy world is apparently so real to them that, uh, oh, like. Oh, oh. Before you go on, I think it might be real in in the universe of this book. It's not real. But then how does the floating moose head work? Okay, yeah, the floating moose head <laughs> is confusing. I can't There's figure that out. There's a lot of mystical characters. Here, okay, here, let's give a well, rundown need- of the mystical characters. The, uh, I think persona we need to- dramatica. All right, so I think we need to explain to them, like, what the fuck is going on so they go into the woods and they see all kinds of weird mystical creatures and shit and they name all the places with different cutesy kids names like oh these bendy trees are called the bendies and then the top of the hill is where you can see everything which is all capitals then there's the two trees which is like two trees near each other that's like a gateway into too far which is the area that's just beyond the crest of the hill that they're not supposed to technically go to yeah, I mean, they technically aren't supposed to go to most of these places, but yeah, the too far is the furthest point from their houses uh, that they ever go. Um, and on their first adventure, um, I was kind of like into the book right at the beginning. Like I was creeped out by the by the the kid, the first kid conversation, but then I was like, I don't know, maybe it'll get better. And they go on this first adventure, and it's apparently still kind of chilly, even though it's supposed to be summer. I don't know. And they encounter shivers, the the evil frost and mist uh guy in the woods and i actually thought that was yeah yeah he's he's kind of a decently malevolent villain i guess you could say even though like he doesn't do much except kind of chase them around harass them and threaten them yeah i mean i'm kind of i'm kind of into shivers i thought that he was appropriately creepy although sometimes the things he said to him would have been way over a six-year-old's head um, How about I actually have a, a piece of Shivers dialogue queued up here. So basically Shivers shows up anytime it gets too cold or dark and there's mist everywhere and the kids have to run and escape his vaporous form that trails them and sometimes maybe cuts off their air supply a little bit is the worst that he does. But here's yeah. how Shivers talks. Can you see? A feast in your honor it's laid at the head of the table. That's me. I chew, I digest, I belch, I void. Romance you seek and romance you'll find. Here, do you hear? All those voices lifted together, whistling cake, uh, buzzing livers, lungs blown with mold, glorious, and you're there. I hear you both in the swelling choir. Your tiny pipes join mankind's longed-for Esperanto. Hyphae ending, mulch to all, shivers peace worldwide. Yeah, so what? sometimes that happens, and what? it's it's way yeah. That was you picked a what very. What does that mean, Paris? Uh, that was a really good selection. Um, he's trying to explain how evil he is, but he does it in a way that's it's just it's just jerking off words, just jerking off his vocabulary at that point. Um, I think he's saying that like he's some he eats things and they join his like his body so they're part of him and then shivers peace worldwide is like him consuming everything or yeah something? yeah basically like like imagine uh what's the evil remember those like it's basically uh, movies from when we were a kid with like rudolph and santa sure yeah what, that what makes is, sense is I, old man winter no Jack Frost? i'm not gonna lie to you paris basically this villain is the same as the big villain in my D campaign that i run which that's, is kind of hilarious that's hilarious um except it's not a frost spirit it's just a giant evil tree but, oh well you know. there you go <laughs> um but yeah so i was like i was like down with shivers i thought i was pretty good you know villain for kids and i was like oh okay i get it they're like they're personifying the fact that it's getting cold and the wind is picking up you know i was like that's fine i totally get that a child yeah, so might do shivers. that yeah. There is he knows, which is some kind of old 
like Deku tree style thing that repeats a word three times whenever you ask him a question you're supposed to interpret what that means and they use him to like give advice on the weather and if they should go far into the woods today or something yeah he's they're... like the forest google forest ash jeeves forest yeah there's okay so there's he knows there's shivers and then there's the dream man and dawn who are super important to this yeah, whole story um so robbie has uh he kind of worships the the male entity here, the dream man. Uh, and Fristine, of course, worships the feminine Dawn. And um, just like Robbie and Fristine, uh, the dream man and Dawn have a, have a relationship. I forget where, the, I think they both first encounter them in dreams. I think that, you know, Robbie encounters the dream man in a dream at first. He's like some weird entity that Robbie has a dream about that has like an open cauldron whirlwind head with dragonflies buzzing inside it. Yeah, he describes, and, he describes his head as an open jar, like a giant open jar. Yeah. But it's like a, a whirlwind of dragonflies inside, and each dragonfly is a thought, and that's representative of like all the millions of thoughts that are circling around in the dream man's head. And I think Fristine encounters Dawn. She, it, it's some kind of like joy forest spirit that whenever Dawn comes around, Fristine just feels really great all the time. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just found a sentence that I need to read. Okay. This is from the perspective of Robbie. Sometimes you just want a squishy breast to cry on. Oh, yeah, that one. That's him <laughs> yeah. interacting with his mom, basically, because he's sad about something. So he runs to his mom and he just needs to put his hand in the boob. But, you know, I've been there, Robbie. I can understand. Uh, yeah, there's just a lot of a lot of weird child breast, wor breast worship at six when they're like kind of too divorced from breastfeeding and starting to over sexualize breasts and it's creepy. Uh, yeah, sorry. Robbie's really into his mom's boobs. Uh, also out. Grace's boobs because she flashes them at him all the time when he comes over. But apparently. she wouldn't have she wouldn't have them. What? She she's six. She doesn't have. It's just no Grace, not for Steen. Oh Grace, Grace I'm, yeah, mom, she wouldn't. <laughs> I was like, I was like, why did excessive Sorry, drug Jesus. use just yeah, wither yeah, her yeah, breasts? Turn, like what? It's little known fact: if you do enough heroin, your tits fall off. Yeah, it, it's apparently. <laughs> Good lord. Okay. Um, That's a Chris medical fact. Chris, yeah. Dr. Chris, and don't do the heroin, or your tits will fall right off. Um, and so, and so, you know, the, these children, you know, and, and like we we're saying, you know, first scene is all about Dawn and, you know, Dawn and the Dream Man, whatever. Um, and the, re the reason these kids are developing these really deep worlds and escaping into the woods all the time is because both of their family lives are fracturing at a pretty rapid rate. Um, so, like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Robbie's dad and uh, mom have attention because the whole family was moved here to Alaska for the dad's, you know, graduate or doctoral degree or whatever at the university. The mom really doesn't want to be there. Um it's never explicit, but it kind of seems like she might be bipolar or suffer from severe depression. Like, I'm not really sure because she has, like, these manic episodes where, you know, she, like, screams and smashes their whole dinner and, like, all this stuff. But most of the time she's just really sad and quiet. So, eh, manic depressive, maybe. Uh, I don't know. But she clearly has some kind of uh, emotional issue, um, emotional, psychological issue. And, um... You know, she's she's painted as the really unreasonable one. And, like, I think she is a little unreasonable in her parenting of Robbie, but it kind of... The book kind of just, like, throws her under the bus. I mean, she changes her mind about Robbie based on, like, the dad's input to an extent. At first, she's very reluctant to let Robbie go anywhere, even outside that much. She's Because she's like, why are you letting him go out to the woods? He's six years old. And the dad's like, that's what kids, my, you know, we used to do that growing up. They need to be free and, like, allowed to hurt themselves. And that's, like, a major source of tension with Robbie and his parents. And then there's also just something between the mom and dad. It, it's, it seems to be implied that the dad and mom got together because they were both free spirits that like to hike all the time. Yeah, but then yeah. the dad had to settle down for a career. And even though they moved down to Alaska, so you think the free spirit mom would be into it she's not and there's like so, there's, i don't there's something else that i i swear to god there's an implication in one scene that the mom isn't doing something in bed that the dad wants i i swear to god that was implied no in one... no there's a line where the mother implies that uh the father hasn't had sex with her in a long time that's the only uh that's oh, the only thing that right. happens when she's having one of her like manic uh episodes but yeah, so, you know, kind of typical 
adult stuff happening. And I do think the adult dialogue was mostly, uh, you know, the adult dialogue between adults <laughs> was mostly fine. Yeah, um, sounded like reasonable people yeah, talking. Yeah, sounded totally fine, uh, especially when they had arguments. I felt like the dad was especially like really realistic. I, I, yeah, it seemed it seemed pretty good. Um, but then for Steen's life, obviously, is fracturing because her mom doesn't take care of her. Like, there's often no food in the house. Robbie, you know, sneaks She'll her sandwiches. She'll just leave for days at a time to yeah, leave she just disappears. in the house. Yeah, so for Steen, like, has to actually fend for herself at six years old. And um, so Robbie will give her, like, sandwiches or a potato he hid in his room, like, whatever. Um, at one point, the kids are over at Christine's house because her mom has been gone for days. And Grace's boyfriend shows up and, like assaults the children almost he like breaks some windows and like screams at them and threatens them which i thought was really weird like what is he gonna get out of the kids if the mom isn't there i i mean i know that adults will obviously abuse children but it didn't seem like there was a lot of motive for him to like you said you know what is he gonna get out of screaming and yelling and breaking the windows these kids i mean i know that initially he thought that they were lying and saying she wasn't there but like i don't know It, it seemed a little Seemed like it was a little, a little crazy. He also just, like, leaves some, like, I guess heroin pills over there or, like, like red pill capsules that I'm assuming are supposed to be some kind of opiate or, or something like that. And he just, like, leaves some there even though he's looking for Grace and he's all like, oh, she only wants me around when she wants to get, when she's out of dope. But he still leaves some there. Like, yeah. It's not a very profitable drug dealing yeah. uh, enterprise, my I don't friend. know. Yeah. So it's really, that's really confusing. Um, oh, Dwayne. Dwayne is his name. Yep. Um, and the kids actually, uh, actually, like, taunt him uh, and stuff, like, in the second interaction they have with him. It's just, like, really weird. Uh, she tells him, like, Dwayne isn't good in bed. That's what mom said. And he gets really enraged yeah, that a six year old said he wasn't good. He tells wasn't those a... kids to suck his dick, which <laughs> is pretty stupid. And then the kids, of course, repeat it because that's what you do. Robbie as a kid. repeats it to his mom, which is like a hilarious moment <laughs> yeah. when, like, it's like under his breath, Robbie Mart suck my dick to his mom, <laughs> which is like, again, totally like a 14, 15 year old thing to do, not a six year old thing. <laughs> yeah, it's a, little, it's a little much. Um, so, anyway, so the kids are like having a really rough time. Uh, around when all this stuff is happening, they go to the woods and they see Dream Man and Dawn consummating their marriage in the sky, and then they float down to Earth. Yeah, so the way it's described is like, oh, there's a big man in the sky with spikes all over his body and a mushroom-tipped head, and then there's a furred, feathered woman thing. That's all I really... There was no more description besides it's female and it has a bunch of feathers around it, and it's also moaning a whole lot. I guess. Yeah, like, Robbie's like, oh no, he's hurting her, and the girl's like, no, she liked it. And I was like, ugh, why would a six-year-old be able to recognize that? That's horrifying. So, but, okay, so, Paris, if it's not real, how are they both seeing it, and what are they seeing? Well, that was the thing that um, that I didn't understand, is that they were, like, sharing delusions, but... Because it's real, Paris. No, it's not real. The kids are not... Okay. Then so... how does a floating moose head transport oh, okay, them okay. around the forest, we're not. Paris. We're not to the floating moose yet. <laughs> Calm your fucking moose boobs. Calm down. No, um, I will not. These moose titties are out, okay? Tuck in those like moose braces. breasts. Uh, I don't know what's happening right now. Um, so shit gets really bad. They see, you know, the dream man and Dawn consummate their marriage, which I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess the kids, I feel like if What were they seeing then, Paris? Like, what were they looking at? Well, it seemed like what they were doing at first was, like, looking up at, like, the clouds and shadows, and they were just like, it was one of those, like, oh, that looks like that. And you're, you know, you're like, oh, yeah, it does look like a dragon fucking a frog. Yeah, (laughs) I guess you're right. You know, you know, when you're just looking at clouds and shapes in the sky. But then they took it a step further because I, I guess Rich is saying like, oh, their home lives are so horrible. They had to create this other reality. But I, I mean, they're A, they're six, which is kind of young. Um, and B, like they weren't being physically or sexually abused. So like. For me, it's kind of a bridge too far. God damn it. I hate it. I hate it. The fucking title is too far. And it I mean, the, the title is pretty appropriate because I feel yeah. like in some respects, Rich did go a little too far yeah, in some really of did. these scenes. Yeah, and... um, bump. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's just a little. Yeah, it's a little too much. Uh, so then so the, when the... Well, well, that's the only step, by the way, that's only step one of like the God marriage consummation ritual, which I guess also, by the way, leaves like red water 
cum god pools. Oh yeah, or that's something. right. Yeah, so where the where they see this happen, uh, there's like this big pool, and the water in it is red, which I mean, I assume just must be a result of uh, the wildlife in that area. Um, it seems like Rich knows a lot about this maybe i mean unless he just looked up a bunch of plant names and really doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about i don't know um but yeah the kids kind of indicate that that's like the leavings from this oh yeah <laughs> i don't know where they draw this conclusion I but don't know. The, i think fristine again is like oh yeah no this is the result of what we saw this is, this is pieces of them floating in here or whatever at the so, bottom yeah something like that and like past the pool um I don't remember how far, but past the pool, there's this, they find this burned out cabin. And um, in the burned out cabin, uh, there is this old moose head, you know, like a, a game trophy, like, you know, people hunt animals, they just cut off their heads and mount them, which is fucked up. But anyway, um, there's this burnt up moose head. Um, I think it was a moose. Mm -hmm. And it was, they, they're like, oh, his name is Hans. So not Hans, like h-a-n-s hands as in like your fucking your fucking meat hands like yeah. the whole things both of your vegetable hands much harder to control yeah it's it's weird um so they, they also give this moose head a, a character in that it can detach itself from the wall and lift them up and fly them to different parts of the forest yeah. and like there's definitely some parts that they're flown to that are inaccessible by them normally as they stay paris so how did they get there if they weren't literally flown around by a moose. Yeah, I mean... And then, in a basket. Yeah, and Paris. there's... Yeah, the moose is attached to a basket, which was confusing. Oh, wait, no, it's not a real basket. It's his antlers. I'm sorry. They refer to his, his antlers as a basket. He's not attached to a basket. Um, Yeah, I don't... I don't understand... <sighs> Yeah, I mean, I know Rich is trying to say, like, oh, but isn't the line between reality and fantasy so thin? Like, eh, not really. I mean, I, I know he's trying to get everyone to really <laughs> to really buy into this fantasy world so that, as a reader, you can believe the things that are happening with these children. But it's I, I don't really like, like Chris said, it sounds like it's it's so it sounds like it's real. It's like it's like too much. It's just. It's too, um... What, what if they shared the same things and, like, they both feel these, like, joy waves when uh, Dawn shows up, who's described as, like, some kind of, like, glittering, winged fairy woman that just laughs and giggles and you feel real good when she's yeah. around. Un unless, my one theory is, like, there's a needle, like, a patch they have to crawl through that's pretty low. They have to get on their hands and knees and there's, like, needled plant vines or material around them that, like, sometimes stab them a little bit. So unless those are, like, hallucinogenic needle plants that like stab them a little bit and they both have the same trips yeah i mean that's a that's actually a really good theory because i was i was theorizing like oh man these kids must have been taking drugs and not the not the fake fucking not real pot brownie like <laughs> i i mean i just couldn't i couldn't also, I don't care what kind of pot you're taking. You're not going to see shit like visual hallucinations no, no, no. like that of aren't course, common no matter how fucking stoned you get. No, no, no. Of course not. Yeah. So I was thinking like, oh, man, maybe they were taking some of Grace's drugs and it's just like off screen or something. And you're supposed to assume that. But I don't think that that's what Rich was intending. Um, however, as I said before, I really think this would have been more compelling if they were 16 and actually taking hallucinogens. Um, yeah. It would make so much more sense. Um, you know, you'd have to probably rewrite some of the family shit. I mean, not even that much. Uh, but yeah, I mean, these kids have these really vivid hallucinations and they share them. And like Chris is saying, I mean, I know that, you know, when you play pretend, like you kind of all agree, like, okay, I'm the dragon, and, you know, you're the knight, and the couch is the castle, and I think it's supposed to be something like that. <laughs> and the that. clouds are a giant penis god, fucking <laughs> yeah. a giant woman god. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's something like that, where it's just kid games, but the way that he describes it makes it seem so serious and so real. Like you said, if hands... By the way, Paris, not, I don't want to interrupt, but I just had a realization here, like, yeah. if the dream man is all, like, filled with dragonflies and everything, and they kind of have, like, a shape, if his head was like the mushroom shaped part does that mean that his jizz is dragonflies and he has dragonfly jizz which is frightening i mean bug jizz bug maybe. jizz is the worst phrase i've ever thought of oh, in my entire life and i feel really bad that i thought oh, of it oh yeah yeah that's, please help me oh geez well we're gonna move on to talk about something else um so anyway i think it's really just supposed to be kids you know having their kid games but it's 
it's confusing. You know how your kid games end up with like ritual worship of nature gods all the time. Right. I know when I was a small child and uh, I went to the park, I would set up my altar to Urga and... <laughs> And find a rabbit and slit its throat. No, it's, yeah, um, <laughs> blend my blood with the rabbits in order to get yeah. closer to the the cauldron of thought flies. Oh in his shit! Jar we, head. For, we forgot a really important point. Um, the kids. So the first couple times they're just normal and they're wearing clothes, but for almost the whole book they get oh, naked yeah. when they go into the woods. Oh yeah, every FYI. time they go, they, every time they. But yeah, here's the wonderful way the title works. Every time they go too far, they 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 strip all their clothes, and I, which I think might be going a little too far. Rich, I, I, the whole like hippie nature thing is a little too much for six year olds. Yeah. So by I the mean, way, when they're some of those cuddling scenes we read, that's unclothed. Yeah, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, they're not they're not wearing clothes, which probably casts a just an extra layer of on everything. Um, again, if you just made them teenagers again, or yep, a little older, yep. it would make a whole lot more sense. Yeah, if like if you're on drugs, I could see being like, oh man, let's let's get naked. Like we gotta get I don't to even nature. Think, honestly, like, I don't see why you have to be on drugs to do that. To be honest with you, like if you know you're gonna be alone and like there's not too many mosquitoes around, then like eh, you know, or you got the off with you, spray yeah. that on. I wouldn't mind it, but then I'd probably get, like feel weird after like five minutes and probably want to suit up again. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess, like I know it's the Alaskan wilderness, but it's like, well, if you met each other out here. You know, there's a pretty good chance you're going to probably meet another person at some point. I mean, people do live in the area. Um, yeah, but that, also, this is kind of a sidebar, but Fristine has a habit of every time she jumps out at Robbie from her bushes all the time. <laughs> yeah. Whenever, like, whenever she can never greet Robbie like normally when he's going over her house. She always like if she's not inside the house, she's leaping at him from some bushes for some reason no 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 it's when it's when she's visiting him close to his property because she's hiding from his mom but it is really funny yeah she's always just <laughs> leaping out of the bushes <laughs> at him. It, uh. frightening like she's literally like the manic pixie dream girl trope but in a six-year-old six because she's this old. mystical hippie girl yep. that like you know totally takes robbie away on a magical adventure oh, except she's no. fucking six. Oh god you're right you're right you're so right it's just Zoe De Chanel at six. That's no, all. No, no, I don't <laughs> want to think about this. This is just a new girl spinoff. Turns yeah, out. this is a new girl spinoff called Too Far. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let's watch Zoe De Chanel and Michael Sarah get naked and run through the woods. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> gosh, let's I, never. I don't want to watch that movie. Let's never do that. Please, please, network television executives. In the in the, in the network don't, TV adaptation, that's our next. That's our next portraying oh, series. Is, is too far. Oh. But this is like a multimedia experience, though, because oh, once no, again, Rich I forgot. Rich had to make, like, an album to accompany this. And let me, like, I know we were just talking about, we, we spun off from what we were talking about, like, five times already. But I want to mention my little uh, thesis on Rich Shapiro, because he, he made some more music again. And it just sounds just like the wild animus accompanying music in that Rich has a lot of kernels of good ideas. And there's, like, competency in, like, some of the moments. But they're mangled together in a way that it, it, it's almost like a loose pile of random leaves and flowers from all different kinds of biomes and there's you're supposed to think that they fit together in a way and each individual one might look neat but together it's just a pile of trash that has no connection to each other besides being a story or being a song like the melodies kind of start to have good things but nothing repeats itself that much i can't get a hook there's no recurring sections all through composed i hate it paris yeah, I unfortunately didn't uh, didn't listen to it. I I just didn't even think about it until the last minute. I was like, oh no, um, so I I have no comments on it. But I remember listening to the one. So he he makes these soundtracks for every book he creates apparently, um, and he made one for or at least for these two. He made one for Wild Animus and it was fucking awful. The Wild Animus one had had verbal chants in it too that corresponded with the book, which thank fuck he did not do in Too Far because. If there was, like, a little girl being like, and then as I rubbed his cheek while we were I naked in the woods. Into the, I can oh, God. speak to the air. Yeah, I would have I would have taste the them. universe. Yeah, I'm really glad that that did not happen. So maybe he learned something from Wild Animus and was like, oh. He, nah, his, music produ his music didn't really improve because, again, it's like a loose collection of individual motifs that might sound good if you structure them in any way, but it, it, I... I like some repetition in my songs. I like form and structure. And th there's not even like a 
the phrases is, is all awkward in my book. Maybe some people might like it if you just like vaguely folky music that doesn't really have a strong hook to go back to. It, yeah. It's just like his writing. There's like pieces of decent things, but like I can't see the bigger picture tying together in a satisfying way. Yeah, it seems a, meandering and and like stream of consciousness. Yeah, like as as a whole, it doesn't really work. I, I see what you're saying. Um, Rich Shapiro is uh yeah he's really like Chris was saying really into the multimedia experience. Um, there is even an app for the book. Um, I don't, I don't even know. know what that thing does. I, I, I read know. that there was one, but I don't know if he's done it for uh for everything. But it better not be a fucking naked six year old app oh, because God, then no. the police should be. A- <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's like the book. Uh, there's apparently more art. The art is actually kind of all right. Uh, and all the music the is all Rich together. Has- all the stuff that Rich has art for, the art is really good, and it's done by other people. So whoever he commissions for his art, I really like their style. Yeah, I think I think the art is is pretty good. Like I said, and I even think his writing has, dare I say, improved um, in this. I still, let me be clear, I still don't recommend reading this um, unless you're going to read everything and ignore the plot, like just read the descriptions. Um, if I can find one that's good, I'll read it. Um, I, f- I did find another uh, <laughs> another weird piece of dialogue from grace the mom who's like you know abusing substances and stuff she comes back to find the kids in the house and she goes go on grace shooed her daughter then she looked at robbie oh i see what you see she said half to herself half to Christine. he he's a real man (laughs) she's saying that about a six-year-old child like like her her daughter's playmate like what the fuck? It's just so strange. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. And, and he so, walked in there smoking a cigarette with an open <laughs> flannel shirt a little bit, put, just hopping off his truck. Yeah, uh, that's a real. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think the only I will say there there weren't um, there weren't that many like typos or syntax or gr- grammatical errors. Uh, the only thing I kept noticing was whenever he used myriad, uh, he kept forgetting the the word of after it. So we kept saying, I see a lot like, of people use that word in that yeah, way. Yeah, so. it's. I don't think that's right though. Like, it just seems weird. Like saying myriad rods instead of a myriad of rods. A myriad rods. Well, the thing is, yeah. he uses the he uses the article a before it. A myriad. Ro- I don't know. It it sounds yeah. weird, but he did anyway, that instantly. How about we get back to the second half of the story where things start getting extra weird? Because we didn't talk. We were about to get into talk about the second half of your god marriage ritual, which is to burn your woman alive so that her body may become one with the air or something? Uh, no, it's the the ritual. It, it, they make a child suicide pact at the age of six is what happens. But it, it's because they're mimicking the, the gods doing a thing in that cabin that they witnessed. Yeah. Um. So they, you know, like I said, they get to the burned out cabin and they imagine that the gods have said, oh, this is, you know, where we had our transformation. Uh, and the gods constantly tell them, oh, life is so much easier without a body. Da, da, da. Like, you know, when you don't have a body, sure is, you, I sure am happier. Like, this is the final transformation. And, um, yeah, so child suicide pact at the age of six, which I also think is incredibly unrealistic. Um, I, I can't imagine to, I, that happening. I guess- because their family lives were rough, they're like, oh, man, it would feel better to not have bodies about this. Even though, again, they're not getting, like, physically abused. Yeah. Except Christine, who is, like, malnourished a little bit, so she feels hungry a lot of the time, so I can kind of get that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like most children would be like, let's run away together on the physical plane, like normal yeah. humans, you know? And that would be, that Apparently would Apparently they have enough of a metaphysical understanding of, like, a life after life, or, like, they, uh, they grasp death enough to also be scared. I mean, six-year-olds would be scared of fire, maybe? Because they're both <sighs> scared of doing it and mimicking them so that they can leave their earthly bodies. Yeah, they're, they're apprehensive. Um... So I so remember when you were saying that you think maybe they could have gotten scratched by some needles of a plant and maybe been infected with something that was like hallucinogenic or whatever. Yeah. Um, I just noticed, or rather remembered. Remember we were talking about that gross red water. Yeah. They they drink it. They do. Yeah. I think. <laughs> they also eat random berries and shit in the woods. So I'm wondering if maybe your theory is correct, and that the reason this kind of like becomes really realistic and spirals out of control to you know and ends with a six-year-old suicide pact is 
because they really are getting drugged by weird plants, but it's the Alaskan wilderness. I don't know that there's anything that grows out there that would have those qualities, but I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm, I don't know shit about botany. Also real so. lucky that it's all just hallucinogenic stuff and not poison stuff, if that yeah. is what's happening. But I really don't think that's happening because there's no consistency. They're not always touching something before they go anywhere. Like, the needle patch is after some stuff. Like, that's after the he knows tree that gives them weather updates with its, like, <laughs> right. weird chanting. So I think, oh, Paris, I think this is real. That's a bummer. Um, so, so you know, the kids contemplate suicide together at six so that they can be like the gods that they have apparently made up themselves. So that's confusing. Um, and I forget what happens. Oh, yeah. Robbie's dad leaves. And you know how Ro- Robbie's dad leaves? I mean, he eventually comes back, but like he basically was like leaving the family. And all, all he does is give Robbie a kiss on the head and goes, goodbye. And then just like yeah. walks out into the night, like. <laughs> and then he comes like, back later, like and he's days like, later. They, they're trying, yeah, they're trying to be like a good family again. It was like, really, that's all you're gonna leave? If you, he, the dad is written as if he does care about his son, but like just that and that one, seems... that one scene, yeah, didn't make sense. Um, so yeah, the dad leaves. He comes back. They, the then parents he struggle. Again. He leaves again. Eventually comes back or something. Or no, he leaves again. Yeah, and I don't know. The kids finally decide like. All right, we're gonna do it. This is it. Tonight's the night. Fuck this life. We're six years old. We we've had enough. We haven't. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I, it's so I hard for me to talk about it. My breakfast this morning. I'm gonna burn myself alive. Robbie's like, you know what? I haven't had enough tits squished against my face because <laughs> yeah. you know that's There's like no something... reason to be here anymore. That is actually a more consistent touching point in this book than a lot of other things. Squishy True. tits. Yeah. Squishy yep. tits and how great they are. Um. While I agree, it's not really the appropriate uh, place for that. <laughs> yeah. So they, you know, they they go out. They and and at this point, it's uh, it's after the summer, and I think oh, that's oh, that's right. I remember why they decide to to fulfill their child suicide pact is because Robbie's mom is like, oh, I have such great news. We're leaving, and you're never gonna see your friend again because they decided they were gonna move uh, they were gonna move back because the dad left them or whatever. So she was like, yeah, we're going to move back to, she says the states as though they're in another country, but I think she just means the 48 contiguous states, but yeah. uh, it's weird. Um, so yeah, we're going to move back to, you know, the 48 contiguous states um, and you're never so going to see. So they decide to throw yeah. one last big bonfire with themselves in the middle of it. <laughs> yep. Dark soul style. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They really, yeah. They really go fucking, uh, they go fucking, what's her, what's the, Kailana, the pyromancer spider? Yeah. yeah they go, Qu- no, they Kailana. go the, the witch of uh, Isleth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They go the exactly. witch of Isleth on this shit. Uh, and Shivers might be a Dark Souls boss. They did, they, they yeah. did roll down that hill to get away from him. That's true. Yeah, they. You know what? <laughs> these kids are great at rolling. Oh my god! I'm gonna make these kids as characters next time I play a uh, version of Dark Souls. <laughs> but you can't wear any armor. You just have to always be. <laughs> That's too hard. Oh, always be naked. Literally naked. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but uh, so you know, basically, Robbie's like. You can't keep me away from the woman I love. Another, you know, the <laughs> exact same thing I said like a couple Fuck books you, Mom, ago. I'm burn myself alive. It's like, oh yeah, when we read the betrayal, it's like it's like the yeah. same shit, fucking same shit, different setting, like every fucking book. God damn it. Well, God well, damn you know, it. Like lighting yourself on fire is like this big symbolic thing. Like, oh, I've inflamed with my passion for uh, so, what I want to do. So it's like it's like after the summertime. Uh, so it's actually getting quite cold because it's fucking Alaska. <laughs> Imagine if Robbie had to like try to. Bob, you don't understand the dragon. Fl- the dragon jarhead man dragonfly jarhead man told me to burn myself alive in the woods because he that's the way he married his fairy goddess mom you yeah. don't understand yeah and then he came in the lake and then we drank that lake water and <laughs> now we are committed we can't go back <laughs> robbie you're um, not allowed to that forest ever <laughs> yeah yeah and and so they decide to go out on this night but of course it's a night that's super cold um and so they're I don't know why, but they, like, didn't really... I mean, there's... It's another... So, this is, like... There are some inconsistencies here with how the kids are so, you know, enlightened and they have all this, like, metaphysical awareness and they're gonna go commit suicide at six together. But, like, they can't remember to bring a fucking coat and extra socks. Oh, yeah, also, Robbie can't make a phone call. That's a thing that is in the book all the time. Yeah. Like, 
He, I, he has I a very deep understanding of the realms beyond perception, but that fucking phone really trips him up, man. Like there's a there's a there's a couple of sentences where he's like, "Yeah, you know, he'd watch mom use the phone and he talked on it, but he really wasn't sure how it worked." And I was like, "Man, I know how to make a phone call at six. My parents taught me so that if I ever was lost, I would know how to make a phone call, like at a store or something." I feel like that's a well, maybe not in this day and age, but when we were uh, when we were children and you know phones were not in everyone's pockets and shit and children didn't have phones it was like something a lot of parents did like make sure you know your phone number and your address and you know this is how you call home and so it seems totally bizarre to me that these six six year olds like i don't know how to use a phone <laughs> like what but you know um, what he does know how to use mushrooms and LSD. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's very similar to when we read um the Art of Racing in the Rain, which is sadly another lost episode, uh, that book is about, it's kind of the same thing, but imagine if it was a dog and it was about uh, indie car racing, where yeah. like the dog had really inconsistent knowledge of an interaction with the world where like he could watch TV and understand what was going on, and he had all these complex thoughts, but like couldn't what's a do, car though yeah yeah but like couldn't understand i don't know i can't remember exactly but oh yeah couldn't understand that his like stuffed toy wasn't real like it was just yeah so this has a similar problem where there's like this weird dissonance um at times between the characters like you know just uh, in a flip of the page so these kids you know they go out into the cold and they they try to go to too far and honestly i don't understand how they think the fire they're gonna start a fire because they don't bring anything with them to start a fire they don't bring matches they don't bring a lighter uh they don't bring like gasoline or oil the, the, or the, the the gods themselves will ablaze set them ablaze with the 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 final passion i don't know yeah i'm, maybe. I'm assuming that's how because they definitely don't bring any matches or anything also yeah. i'm pretty sure hands the moose carries them to the cabin in the end um i yeah maybe because shivers is there obviously because it's super cold and like Christine is on the verge of fucking death she, i don't know it seems like they they must have been outside for a really long time i guess this journey must take them literally hours but i didn't really understand that i thought it was just one of those like oh i'm a little kid so distance seems longer than it really is because i have little tiny child legs and i'm a child yep. and like but apparently it actually is super far from their homes because yeah uh Christine is like near death by the time, uh, you know that their saga ends. Um, she has like purple lips and she can barely breathe and she can't really walk very much. And I think that's when Hands comes in and carries them. And then as they're approaching the cabin, what do they see, Chris? Uh, well, the door opens and they expect to see the Dream Man and Dawn in there, but out walks Grace and Robbie's dad. Yeah, which leads me to believe that they were having a weird affair the whole time. Which would explain the mother's increased animosity towards Grace, but then but like there's really no other evidence. Yeah, there's but then really a, nothing else that ever points to that. Yeah, a few sentences later, it just kind of seems like, you know, they were gone for so long, they were reported missing. The mom called the dad, and even though the dad left the family, was like, "Oh fuck, I gotta go look for my kid," and then like he and Grace maybe met up and like went to look for the kids together, which is also very plausible. Um. But why would I, they just be in the cabin? I if, if they're I don't looking, know. would they just like sit in the cabin, going like, "Not in that corner." Well, not in that corner. How'd you check that corner? Check that other corner again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe they were out looking and they were really cold, and they just took refuge in the cabin briefly. I mean, both interpretations are possible, but I choose to believe they were having uh, cabin sex because that would explain why they thought these gods were so real. Because, all right, let's say they came upon them having sex out there but it was like you know maybe in shadow or something and they couldn't really tell it was a, the dad and, and grace um and then you know think about how like when robbie goes to bed every night what happens his dad reads him a story and it's his dad's voice that kind of lulls him to sleep so it makes sense to me that like his dad's voice would be in the realm of his dreams and then if he saw this mysterious figure in the forest and already had this conception that like the dream man was helping him out and then sees you know, and, and, and in, in his head, the voice is maybe his dad's. Like, that actually kind of makes sense. Um, I mean, I as for, as for Christine, when, I have no like, explanation. It could but... be the dad, like, he's seeing the dad, and when it's just his own thoughts doing it. Because the Dream Man definitely comes to Robbie outside of those encounters where he, the Dream Man's with Dawn or whatever. Like, he'll come on his own and, like, 
when Robbie calls him to help them out or something. There's one point where he's like, oh, I have to go soon, but I'll hang out for this one last time with you guys. Oh, wait. Actually, I now remember why I thought they were definitely fucking. Um, because when... I, sorry, I'll just read the passage. Uh, the cabin door swung open. In the orange and gold light, two dark figures appeared, one behind the other. Robbie rose to his feet and so did Christine. He fought his fear and clasped her hand. We're ready, he told them. They didn't look like gods. They had blankets over their shoulders and the bigger one's head was no taller than a man's. The smaller cried out, hurried forward, and knelt before them. The blanket opened and wings emerged. They folded around Christine. Dawn's features were edged by the fire. It was Grace, Robbie saw. My baby, my baby, how in the world? Christine's face was glazed with shock. Grace was glowing. She was covered with oil, and her eyes were like nothing Robbie had ever seen. Black and wild, mostly pupil, with orange rays around them, like bear tracks or claw marks painted on her cheeks. Forcine saw the same, and something else. Robbie followed her gaze. There were needles bristling from a tiara of wands circling Grace's head. The fire swelled inside the cabin. Giant flames speared through the roof. Scarlet tapers were piercing the walls, sighing and whistling. No, Christine whimpered. Her head turned and Robbie saw her desperate plea. But there was no time to react. The man was stepping toward him. Through the gap in his blanket, he was naked to the waist. His chest glinted, like grace. He was covered with oil and painted strangely, his trunk banded purple and littered with stars. Behind him, the blaze blossomed through the doorway. The cabin was a furnace, its insides pure flame. The man stooped, his face stubbled black. Then the lips, the smile, also familiar, and the dream of leaving, dark and gleaming in those distant eyes. Robbie? Dad said. They were definitely fucking and doing drugs in that cabin. Sorry. I, Re I guess, reading that yeah, passage, that it, it, seems, it seems a little more obvious. Repeat the, but wait, wait, they're both covered in oil and she has a, a, a crown of needles in her head? Uh, yeah, I don't. maybe he was what? like a psychology grad student and they were doing weird experiments. I, I think they were just having sex and I, th I think really Dawn was just a... Uh, like a romanticized version of Christine's mom, like maybe when Grace, before Grace got hooked on drugs or something. Uh, yeah, so a really. I don't think she would like disassociate her mom into like two different people, though. Oh man, sure, kids, kids do fucked up shit, and then and then just coincidentally, they were both having sex. So I don't know. I I, I feel like I'm getting closer to what's actually going on that's here, but it's probably still... what it was supposed to be, right? Like that's probably what we, what we were supposed to take away that they just kept stumbling upon their two parents having an affair all the time and they somehow interpreted that that's some kind of like i guess it was really fucking good sex if they interpreted it as god sex yeah i guess um and then so the other but thing wait, but wait but wait they see the first encounter they see them in the sky right uh, <laughs> i don't know so were the were you unless you're telling me like their parents were literally fucking levitating into the air? No, no, no. I think that and it's doing easy. missionary that way. No, no, no. I think it's easy for kids to graph concepts onto people. You know, it happens. Um, it really seemed like they were way up in the sky, not like hovering or like close to the ground, but like they were like enormous and huge and in the fucking sky. Yeah, well. So I don't. That's really what muddies it for me. But uh, but anyway, something that really I really dislike about this book is how it ends. It ends in like two paragraphs. Right like, after that, we basically. spend yeah. Right after that scene, it's like over. And guess what? The kids just move apart. They never see each other again. Fuck everything. That's it. And, but they remember that summer fondly. The end. Yeah. That's really all. I, so I don't know what the point. Like they were that he, Rich was trying to make to this story. Besides, like they had some adventure and they almost killed themselves, but then they <laughs> yeah. didn't. Yeah. Like. Yeah, it kind of. I almost wish they had killed themselves. Yeah, that would have been a, like a way. Like I, you know, the like, kids got so caught up in their own world that they like this horrible yeah. tragedy happened, but then it didn't, and instead they just fondly remembered this weird trippy summer they had. Instead, it ended. Instead, it ended like a Goosebumps book. Like we went back yeah. to R.L. Stein, and he fucking finished this ending. Is Rich Shapiro an R.L. Stein go uh, ghost writer? <laughs> ghost writer. Ghost writer. Yeah, that's what you call him. Is he an R.L. Stein ghost writer? <laughs> Oh, that, fuck. That's how actually how R.L. Stein puts all his books out so quickly. An army of geese at typewriter. <laughs> you would think it'd be the monkeys, but turns out it's the geese that really crank out the hits. Oh, wow. Goose writers. Okay, I didn't even I didn't catch that. Um, yeah, so don't don't read this book. I mean, I like I said, I kind of felt like it wasn't 
the worst based on our experience with Wild Animus. Um, so Wild Animus was way worse and way more pretentious oh, and yeah. way up its own butt. This one is like kind like it's just like its own arm is up its own butt. No, for it's like just some like, mild pleasure. No, it's like thinking about putting a suppository in, but it like hasn't really done it yet. It's kind of how it feels. If I swear to God, if the kids were like eleven to thirteen, this would be like a B plus book. I, I can't believe I'm saying that about a Rich Shapiro joint. Yeah, but... like all right, I should really find some of the nice descriptions. Um. Because they they are actually pretty all right. Like it reminded me, um, like if Swamplandia was way shittier. Like this is kind of what it would remind me of, and, a, and like way more into like the the trippy imagery or something like that. I have to mention the one note from you that I really liked when I was reading this. Um, it was in a description a part where you had just highlighted someone was being served a bowl of mac and cheese, <laughs> and you had just highlighted the words macaroni and cheese, and I pressed the note link, and it just said "fuck yeah" on there, <laughs> and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I was like... Perhaps one of my favorite notes you've ever made. Because I was so annoyed that, like, I was just annoyed with the book and then mac and cheese. And I was like, fuck yeah, I love mac and cheese. <laughs> I, I just... I, I, when I read it, I heard the, the like, the low tone in it. So I, <laughs> I, I, I'd have to express my appreciation for that while you look for... The de- like the, the, at one point uh, in a dream, one of my favorite parts was uh, Robbie was having a dream and someone the dream man was talking to him in his dream and he told him to crack the sun over his head like an egg yolk in some reference to like uh, like reaching for your dreams really hard or something and i thought that was kind of a neat image i'm not sure what it was getting at exactly but i kind of like the thought so once again yeah, rich has yeah. this ability to like have a couple of good pieces of images but then like when they when i try to put them together in a bigger picture it's a mess that i don't quite yeah. get the whole, what what he's trying to show me um, yeah, I have, I, I found a, a, just a sentence that I thought was good. Um, they were masters of their kingdom now, all the places they knew so well. They sighed and sank into them, wearing them like soft pajamas, content, content to idle and laze. Sorry, I fucked that up. But, you know, I, I, I feel like, you know, these are sentences I would write, which, you know, maybe I was like, oh, you know, because I saw myself in some of the phrasing and stuff. Um, I was like, oh, this isn't that bad, but... Again, yeah, I mean, so I, I guess this is proof that we're not total just out totally out here just to be contrarian. Like, no, but like, laugh at but like, things, here's cause... a question: Like, is Rich Shapiro almost there? I mean, like, if he keeps telling the same story about dude meets a weird girl and they say weird shit to each other and then they get enraptured by some kind of nature god together, like, he might be close to cracking the code on the perfect formula for that one story that he's written both times. Yeah, I mean, I don't like, yeah, I guess I don't like the content, but, like, in terms of writing, there's a, there's a huge improvement from Wild Animus, so, like, I don't know, maybe someday, but, uh, yeah, I don't know, uh, I do think he needs to stop being so fucking weird and pretentious with all of his shit, like, stop making apps and albums that go with your books, it's, it doesn't it's add anything. It's not helping. Nope, it's not it's helping, not, it's just I, making I it weirder. I saw one of your songs, I saw one of the videos you had on YouTube, man, it had 58 views, that's not a lot, it's not working, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, I'm not sure uh, there's much else to say on this. Uh, we've been going on for a time, as we do. Yeah, um, so why don't we do the usual wrap-up of saying that, hey, we got a Facebook, we got an uh, Instagram, we got that portraying, and now, in, in the, since the last episode, all of a sudden we have four people. Yeah, what the fuck? Like, I don't know what's going on. So, Terrible Book Club highlights. So we now have four patrons. I, I don't know. These people are Dari, amazing. Will, Greg, and Veronica. Thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, an extra, extra little uh, trinket of thanks to Dari for upping her uh, her uh, patron contribution. So that was awesome. Uh, so thanks, the four of you. You are um, you are the man behind the TBC curtain. Uh, all four man of you. Man just... did people. What? The, oh, yeah, I guess the man behind the curtain, like the people behind the curtain. I Persons. mean, they're they're probably just like four penguins in a trench coat, right? I mean, like that's exactly. that's what's happening. Um. Yep. <laughs> so uh so yeah thanks thanks be to the four of you uh furthermore uh both radio public and pod beans those are two uh you know podcast kind of like providers hosts uh they somehow in the span of two weeks uh chose us as an indie podcast to listen to um like an up-and-coming indie podcast and uh I don't know, Podbean was like, hey, we think you guys are good. You want a free ad? And I was like, yeah. So, I don't know. Like, thanks, Podbean Radio Public. That was really cool. Uh, I don't Thank really... You. Yeah, I don't really thanks. understand how how both of them kind of found us simultaneously. It was kind of weird, uh, but awesome. So, 
yeah, if you're here uh, from Radio Public or Podbean, you have uh, those lovely people at those lovely institutions to thank. Ho- hopefully we're putting, you know, you listen again to, we read a lot of bad books and it's hard. Yeah, it is. It is real difficult. Um, yeah, I, I feel like it gets easier when we read stuff that's like under 300 pages. It's when yeah, we I really go for we it. We might be trying to pull for like sub 300 pages more often than not here. We'll still probably, I mean, you know, let's be honest. The next sort of truth book is going to hit at some point. Probably not soon. I don't want to do another one. That, no, that I really, quick, I it's... really don't. Um, I really don't. Um, however, though, we probably will do um, another sequel. There is another sequel book slated. Uh, for some at some point this year, and um, we might be doing a crossover soon. Too. Yeah, we're also gonna, maybe doing a crossover uh, with another podcast. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, what else is coming up? I mean, I guess if we um, we're we're all, a all dollar. Our patrons are at the four dollar tier, which I believe allows them to pick a book for us. So we might actually have to submit to the will of Will and Greg uh, and yeah. Veronica. <laughs> well, cor- correction. Um, actually. Uh, most of our patrons are at the five or eight dollar tier. Uh, oh, we have, okay. Yeah, so that's cool. So. Uh, so yeah, if you if you become a patron and pay at least four dollars a month, you get access to all the stupid content we make. Um, and you can also recommend a book that we read. Uh, if you go for the higher tiers, you can have us read a specific passage. Um, and kind of do like a dramatic rendition of it for you. We're not going to be uh, very serious about it. No, uh, probably not. Um, and. Uh, in the final tier, you get all of that. Plus, uh, you get a one of the books we read signed by us, uh, sent to you, free of charge. So, yeah, there's a lot of fun things. Uh, go go check those things out. Uh, interact with us on social media. We enjoy it. I yeah, feel like I'm forgetting com- something, but uh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah that's that right. We, oh, we know right. we're not just shouting this into the void. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. We're uh, we're a dollar away from our first Patreon goal. So like, fuck yeah. Did I ever think that was gonna happen? Fuck no. Nope, uh, nope, 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 never. So really glad that I made those two um emergency goals. Uh, in case we pass the first one, we we now have them. Uh, so yeah, we're a dollar away from our first goal. Um, so even if you just want to throw us a dollar a month, it really makes a difference. All right. Well, I mean, that's about unless you have any further to go, Paris. D- no, I think I've already been too far. Uh, uh, yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. Bye, stay pa- tuned. We, we don't know what the fuck we're reading next time, so it's a surprise for you too. Hooray! All right. Bye, Paris. Bye.